Hello, uh, this is Political Forum for Wednesday, September 18th, 2013. Uh, we welcome today as our guest, uh, State Representative Andre Tapetti uh, from the 32nd District. Uh, thank you for joining us again. It's good to be here. Uh, my name is Rod Joy. I'm a board member here at Can TV. Uh, Political Forum is a live interactive program that allows you an opportunity to have direct conversation with your elected officials. Uh, during the next 25 minutes or so, uh, we hope uh, State Representative Tapetti and some of the issues that and challenges and opportunities uh, that, that he views as essential uh, to the state. Uh, Above all, this program is really about fostering a culture of strong civic engagement in Chicago. Uh, your calls are a major uh, feature of the program, so we invite you to call in to share your views, ask your questions. Uh, you can join us at 312-738-1060, 312-738-1060. Uh, Representative Tapetti, maybe we could start with uh, you uh, sharing with our viewers a little bit about uh, your district. Well, it's, it's first of all, I want to say thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be here on on Can TV. It's so important what Can TV provides uh, to the community. Uh, public access TV is um, beyond reproach, and that's something that we need, especially in a, in a town like the city of Chicago. Uh, while the state of Illinois is huge. That's what Can TV is really all about, making sure that the people have the ability to find out important uh, information about important issues. So having said that, again, my name is Andre Tepetti. I've been a state representative since uh, the year 2009. Uh, I was elected uh, at the same time as President Obama. And interestingly enough, we've just gone through redistricting, uh, that our districts have changed dramatically. Uh, all of our districts have changed dramatically. In the House of Representatives, there are 118 districts, 118. Uh, spanning from as far north as uh, uh, the northern border of uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, all the way down to uh, this town of Cairo, uh, close by uh, Kentucky. And what happened was with the redistricting is, is that we lost so many people in the city of Chicago, at least by way of um, the census, that there were some questions about how accurate those numbers were. Um, but once those numbers came out, and we lost so many individuals in the city of Chicago, our districts changed dramatically. My district, for an example, essentially doubled in width. I repeat, it doubled in width. Uh, initially, my district went from Cottage Grove to Pulaski, uh, no further north than 65th Street, no further south than 83rd Street. But after the redistricting, uh, my district now encompasses the towns of, and you see it there uh, on your overhead projector, uh, you see it, it now goes all the way, including the towns of Burbank, Bridgeview, Hickory Hills, and Justice. So while the population is essentially the same, uh, even though we did lose uh, quite a bit of population, we even lost one congressional seat, uh, my district is even more diverse than it was before. So it's a pleasure to be here and to continue to represent the people in the 32nd District, and I'm looking forward to working with uh, my new constituents in Burbank. Bridgeview, Hickory Hills, and Justice, and being responsive to their needs and concerns. And you're a longtime practicing civil lawyer, and you've been in Springfield now for five years. Correct. Correct. Uh, so you're a, a, a seasoned veteran now in Springfield. That's what they tell me. Uh, what motivated you to, to get involved in uh, public service? Well, you know, Rod, what, what happened with me is, is that my mother and my father have always been uh, committed to public service, especially here in the city of Chicago. Um, my mother is a former circuit court judge. Uh, she was a former president of the Cook County Bar Association, which is the uh, largest uh, African-American bar association in the country. Uh, my father uh, is a physician. Uh, he spent several years working in the hospitals in the Inglewood community, uh, providing those desperately needed medical services uh, there in the, med in the uh, Inglewood community. So it was essentially a natural progression for me to go into public service. I'm definitely not in this business uh, to make money. And in fact, I'm sure you know that Governor Quinn has decided that we're not deserving <laughs> of our paychecks at this point because we can't uh, resolve the, the pension debacle. Um, but having said that, um, uh, you know, public service to me is something that I strive to do every day. Uh, I work hard to be the best state representative that I can. Uh, I'm a student of government. Uh, I'm a student of the process. And I'm learning something new every day. I'm learning something new every day. And I'm always encouraging and I'm always asking uh, my constituents to provide me with information. 
there's no more powerful lobbyist that I'm aware of than my constituents. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got big interest down in Springfield. Everybody knows that. But the most powerful lobbyist to me is you. Uh, all of you people that are out there watching this program, you're the most powerful lobbyist I know, and especially those individuals that are working or living in the 32nd District. Call in, ask me some questions. I'm ready to go, and I look forward to being here this evening. All right, the representative is ready to go. He says you are the most powerful lobbyist in the state. Um, the representative wants to hear your thoughts, your questions. Uh, this is a live interactive show, so please join us. Uh, dial in now at 312-738-1060. Again, that number is 312-738-1060. And Representative, you mentioned uh, Governor Quinn and pensions. So you haven't uh, had a paycheck since the middle of July when the governor said no more paychecks uh, for General Assembly members until there is, a, I believe, a quote, comprehensive solution to pensions. Yes. Now, pensions is arguably the biggest challenge facing our state, uh, 100, nearly a $100 billion uh, problem in terms of our long-term unfunded uh, uh, pension liability. Um, I understand that the General Assembly uh, Pension Reform Commission, chaired by uh, Senator uh, Raul, is making real progress. Uh, tell our viewers your view about this issue, and if you could wave a magic wand, how you would resolve it. Well, I don't know. I, I can appreciate that, and, and you're definitely on the ball. That's exactly what has occurred. What has occurred as far as resolving the $100 billion uh, pension liability, uh, the concern is, at least as far as Andre Tepetti is concerned, is coming up with not just a solution, but a constitutional solution. The Constitution is a, is a very, very important document. It's what this country was founded upon. It's what the state of Illinois is founded upon. That's what the law is all about. And whatever pension solution we come up with, it has to be constitutional. So what has occurred is, is that a conference committee has been put into effect. And what you're looking at right now is one important provision that I believe is highly relevant to the pension crisis. And that is Section 16, Article 1, ex post facto and impairing contracts. No ex post facto law or law impairing the obligation of contracts or making an irrevocable grant of special privileges or immunities shall be passed. That's very, very clear. So the question then becomes is, well, how do we know how pensions fall in as far as being an ex post facto law or a contractual type of obligation? Well. I think that you'll see very shortly on your overhead monitor that, and if you could slide it down just a little bit for me, excellent, Article 13, Section 5, Pension and Retirement Systems. Membership in any pension or retirement system of the state, any unit of local government or school district, or any agency or instrumentality thereof shall be an enforceable contractual relationship the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. I don't think that the Constitution can be any more clear with respect to, as a General Assembly member, I cannot stand up and vote for anything that impairs a contractual relationship, especially as it relates to pensions. You just can't do it. Now, again, I'm not a judge. I'm not a judge. I'm a legislator. And ultimately, any way it goes, we know that there's going to be some litigation. Somebody's going to file a lawsuit, but I feel that I know better. I'm a lawyer, and I can read the Constitution, and I know that a deal is a deal is a deal. If you come to work for the state, tired, you're retiring with a certain expectation. You're retiring expecting that your pension is going to stay in place and your health insurance benefits are going to stay in place, period. If you're working currently for the state, when you came on to work for the state, you came on working with certain expectations. The expectations as far as the state was concerned is that you're going to what? Be at work every day. Do your job. In return for that, consistent with that contract and consistent with that enforceable obligation between you and the state, you are to get certain benefits, one of which is a pension. So the big concern is adjusting the COLA. That's the big thing that the conference committee is looking at. And by the way, the conference committee is composed of 12 individuals, six members from the House, six members from the Senate, uh, Senator Raul and uh, Representative Nekritz 
are the respective co-chairs of that committee, and they are looking at different proposals, trying to come up with something. It has nothing to do with Governor Quinn cutting our checks. We are all committed, uh, trust me, we're all committed to resolving this pension crisis because, as you said, it's a $100 billion problem, and that $100 billion problem is having a domino effect on all the other state issues and state services that we're dealing with. You're watching Political Forum. This is a live, interactive call-in program. We're 100 percent committed to getting to your calls and your questions uh, uh, for State Representative Tapetti. I think we have a caller on the line. Caller, are you there? Hi. Yes, I am here, and I really appreciated that wonderful explanation. I have another uh, legal question, and this is about the um, uh, state gun law. I read in the paper on Monday that the Illinois Supreme Court ruled this week that part of a state gun law is unconstitutional, and I wonder what part that was and what that's going to involve in terms of changes. No, no, thank you very much for your call. And, and what that addresses is certain aspects of the UUW law. UUW is an acronym for unauthorized use of a weapon. So you should not confuse that with conceal and carry. Conceal and carry has been the big issue down in Springfield that we just recently resolved. So as a matter of historical perspective, the state of Illinois was the 49th state, uh, well, strike that, the state of Illinois was the only state to not have some form of concealing carry um, several months ago. A lawsuit was filed. Um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the federal appellate court, uh, rendered a, a decision, and that decision was, was that the legislature, meaning myself, my 117 colleagues in the House, and the 59 senators in the Senate, needed to pass some form of concealing carry by, I believe the date at the time was um, June or July. I can't recall exactly what the date was, but the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals came up with a specific deadline saying that you have to pass some type of concealing carry. If you don't, we're going to pass it for you. So the proposal that I looked at was, is that, and the way that I looked at it was, was that any valid proposal that was up, put up on the board for consideration for voting, I was inclined to support it. I'm not a big gun owner. In fact, I don't even own a gun. Um, but the issue was not how I felt about a person's right to bear arms or actually controlling the amount of guns in the city of Chicago. That was irrelevant to me. What was relevant was, was making sure that we as a legislature provided by and abided by the ruling of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals with respect to conceal and carry. So now uh, in the state of Illinois, conceal and carry is in fact the law does not mean that you can run around with a gun concealed free willy. There are certain requirements um, in order to have a conceal and carry permit. And essentially what those are is that you have to pay, I believe, a $150 fee. You have to undergo 16 hours of training. There will be a background check that will be done. And this will all be governed by the Illinois State Police. So again, the state of Illinois has now joined our 49 other brethren and we now have conceal and carry in the state, and the Illinois State Police will actually be the overseer of the process with respect to conceal and carry. And caller, I hope that I answered your question. Terrific. Um, on the guns issue, you've been very active in the gun debate, and you've also uh, done a lot of homework on where firearms in Chicago originate from. And maybe you could, uh, you know, I know this is an issue in your district, maybe you could say a few words about firearms in Chicago and how those guns where they come from and how they get on our streets. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for asking that question. In fact, that was one of the first issues that I tackled uh, when I came into Springfield, and the voters of the 32nd District entrusted me with going down and representing them in Springfield and speaking for them. Uh, in the 32nd District, crime is a huge problem. It's a huge, huge problem, and I knew that to be an effective legislator, I had to do something to try to tackle that problem. And what I did at the time is, in conjunction with the city of Chicago, I worked very hard with on both sides of the aisle, the Democrats as well as the Republicans, to create what's called the Interstate Gun Trafficking Task Force. And for an entire session, myself and several of my colleagues, along with all of the law enforcement individuals, we actually studied the influx of weapons coming into the city of Chicago. Where are they coming from? 
And after very detailed analysis, we were able to ascertain that an overwhelming majority of the illegal weapons were coming from as far as Mississippi. Hmm. Mississippi is where majority of these illegal weapons are coming from. And what happens is, is that you have something that are called straw purchasers. And these individuals will go down to these stores, these gun stores in Mississippi, and not buy one, not two, but multiple guns, bring them back up to the city of Chicago, and sell them. That's what these straw purchasers do. So that's been something else that we've been looking at is how do we address the issue of straw purchases of illegal firearms? Well, actually, they would not be illegal because they're legally purchased down uh, down in southern, uh, not southern Illinois, but down in the southern portion of the United States, namely Mississippi. But what do we do as far as those straw purchasers when they're grabbing all these weapons down in Mississippi and bringing them up to Chicago and putting our kids in jeopardy? That's something else that I'm working on, and we've got a host of other issues. And in fact, I'm working with Governor Quinn now, asking him specifically for the 32nd District to help me protect my people. And that's, and that's my charge. My charge is to do what I can as a state representative to make sure that I can try to keep the streets safe. Now, again, that comes from a state perspective. You know, the aldermen, you know, they do their thing as far as city services and protecting the folks. Our county commissioners do the same. But my charge is to try to provide the state resources that I can to help. And what I am proposing to Governor Quinn is that he expand the boundaries or at least the patrol area of the Illinois State Police in within the 32nd District. Historically, and I'll be very brief because I know that we've got a caller, but historically, back in 1985, Mayor Harold Washington entered into an intergovernmental agreement with then Mayor Daley to expand the patrol uh, to expand the patrol area of the Illinois State Police by allowing them to patrol up and down our expressways. In exchange, the state of Illinois allowed the lottery to go into O'Hare Airport and now Midway Airport. So I look at it as being a fair exchange. If the state of Illinois is making millions. Um, by way of the lottery sales, certainly they shouldn't have a challenge with allowing the Illinois State Police to come in and give us some support. And I'm not talking about replacing the Chicago Police. I'm talking about providing some additional support in these areas that need the help the most. And again, it's out of the box thinking, but that's what the people sent me down to Springfield for. To think out of the box and try to come up with solutions. Terrific. And perhaps we can dig into that a little bit deeper. Sure. Uh, you're watching Political Forum. This is a live interactive show. Uh, we welcome your calls and questions. Uh, our special guest today is State Representative Andre Tepetti. Uh, the representative believes that you, uh, the citizen advocate, are the most important lobbyist in Illinois, and he wants to hear from you. Absolutely. Uh, I think we have a caller on the line. Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for taking my question. Great. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know, um, are you for or against the raise in the um, minimum wage? Am I for or against the raise in the minimum wage? Mm -hmm. uh, in general, I know that the minimum wage as it exists right now is inadequate. And when you look at the difference between the minimum wage federally and the difference of the minimum wage in the state of Illinois, the state of Illinois minimum wage is higher than the federal minimum wage. But again, it's absolutely inadequate. So what's important to recognize here is that there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance because I'm definitely concerned about businesses leaving the state of Illinois. That's a big concern to me. It's a huge concern because I want to make sure that those businesses stay here, stay viable, so they can continue to employ our people. But having said that, I know that the current minimum wage is completely inadequate. That's a terrific question. I know Governor Quinn is making a push to increase the minimum wage from its current eight twenty-five uh, to ten dollars an hour. I, I think today, uh, if uh, someone, a minimum wage worker working full time, only earns seventeen thousand dollars a year. Uh, terrific question, and thanks for uh, your call. Uh, you're watching Political Forum. This is a live interactive show. Uh, our guest today is State Representative Andre Tepetti. Um, we invite your calls and your questions. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. I know mm. that's an issue that's top of mind for you these days. Huge. Uh, for many people, they believe that health insurance uh, should be a right and not a privilege. Uh, yet today, uh, there are 1.9 million people in Illinois without health insurance. Um, what should our viewers know about the Obamacare Act and what can they do uh, to, to uh, plug into 
uh, the new health care reform? Excellent question. Um, Obamacare uh, is the law uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, it barely passed in the House. There were 63 uh, voting in favor, 55 opposed. Uh, all the Republicans uh, could not support the proposal. Also, what we deem to be target Democrats, meaning that they're in a district that could swing Republican or Democrat, they did not support the proposal either. However, it did pass. It has been signed into law by Governor Quinn, and it is the law in the state. The most important thing for your viewers to know is effective October the 1st of this year, October the 1st of this year, you may begin applying for uh, health insurance coverage. And you see there on, on your overhead projector on your screen a very helpful website, www.healthcare.gov. Again, you see it there on your screen, www.healthcare.gov. So as a result of this action that was taken primarily by the Democrats uh, in Springfield, health insurance will now be available uh, to all adults between the ages of 18 to 64, regardless of your income, regardless of your marital status, regardless of whether or not you have any children or not. You will now have the opportunity to have health care. Okay? Huge. As I said, the application process begins on October the 1st of this year, and coverage will begin on January 1st of this year. Now, it's very important to know that when you are looking at health care options, that you recognize whether or not you truly can, in fact, take advantage of Obamacare. And when I say that is, is that what I mean is, is that there are certain income requirements that are required in order to take advantage of Obamacare. The only individuals that will be able to take advantage of Obamacare are those individuals who have an annual income of 138% or less than the federal poverty level. And I believe that that's roughly about $15,415 per year. Again, $15,415 per year for an individual. For a couple, $31,800. If you're making that amount of money or less, you will be able to take advantage of Obamacare. If you're making more than that amount of money, we still were able to pass significant, significant health care reforms. For an example, there was always an issue about pre-existing conditions, that people could not get coverage for pre-existing conditions. That's over. Even if you have a pre-existing condition, the health insurers will not be able to deny you insurance coverage. They will not be able to do it. And there have been several other um, reforms to the private health care market. So an example, if you're not uh, eligible for Obamacare, you'll then go and have the opportunity to participate in what's called the health insurance marketplace. The health insurance marketplace. And the way that that works is, is that currently the five major health insurers, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, and a cooperative in conjunction with the federal government, have a uh, have, uh, filed and are uh, proposing uh, 165 different health care plans. And then you have the opportunity of looking at those 165 health care plans and making the determination as to which plan works best for you. So again, this is something that's monumental. I know that there's a lot of resistance in uh, Washington um, from the Republicans that are looking to defund uh, the Obamacare program. I don't know what will uh, come of, of that in Washington, but I do know that in Springfield, we have passed the, the, the bill and we're ready to go. Terrific. And uh, our final uh, minute here, let's talk a little bit about taxes. Uh, what do you think should happen uh, with Illinois' uh, income tax on uh, January 1st of 2015? Uh, when it's set to, to fall from 5% to 3.75%? No, that, uh, that's, again, that's another excellent question. And, and I did support um, the increase uh, in, in taxes. While I wasn't happy to do that, I do know that we are having a serious revenue problem, a serious revenue problem. And the biggest um, component to the revenue problem that we're having is that pension, that $100 billion pension unfunded pension liability is putting us in a serious, serious, um, deleterious situation. So with respect to how I view um, continuing on with the increase in the income taxes, I don't know at this time. 
I would really have to look at the numbers to see if it's really having an impact. If it's not having a strong impact, it may not be something that I want to support. But what I do want to support is I do want to support getting additional revenue into the people for the state of Illinois, for our children, for our seniors, and for our citizens who work hard each and every day, as well as our businesses that are committed to working here and having their businesses here in our state. Terrific. We'd like to thank our uh, special guest, State Representative Andre Tapetti from uh, the 32nd District. Uh, we also would like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in. Uh, for our democracy to work, we need an informed and engaged citizenry. Uh, so thank you uh, for tuning in uh, and for calling in, and we invite you to join us next week for uh, the next edition of Political Forum.